We're here at NeurIPS with John Yang of Sweebench and many other things, but welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, really happy to be here. Uh, last year I talked to Ophir and uh, I think Carlos as well, one of your co-authors. Yeah. How's Sweebench doing? Like just, just generally the project is like one and a half years old? Yeah, yeah. So, I think one and a half years old in terms of when it was actually useful. Yeah. And we put it out October 2023 20, and then people didn't really touch it too much. And then of course, like Cognition came on the scene and Devon was an amazing release. And I think after that, it kind of kicked off the arms race. Did they tell you beforehand and they just showed up? Is, you know, I got an email about like two weeks ago. I think it was from, I think it was from Walden. He was like, hey, you know, we have a good number on it. I was like, wow, congrats, you know, thanks for using it. <laughs> and then the release was like mind blowing. I was like, wow, these guys did an excellent job. Yeah, <laughs> Amazing. And then Sweetbench Verified was like maybe last year. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, like, catch us up this year. Like you have uh, other languages. You have, uh, there's like a whole bunch of varieties of Sweetbench now. Yeah. So what should people know? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think there's a couple extensions that have happened. One is like more Sweetbenches, Sweetbench Pro, Sweetbench Live. Um, oh, Sweetbench Pro, was that with you guys? Because it looks independent. It's like different authors. It's completely independent. Yeah. So they yeah. just called themselves Sweetbench Pro without your blessing? Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, I think we're 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 okay with it. Uh, when we came out, we were like, "Oh, cool, interesting." It would have been you know fun to be part of it, but you know, I mean, congrats to them. It's a great benchmark. Yeah, All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, multimodal. Yeah, we one. did multimodal and multilingual, um, and I think like those have multilingual seems is to it, be. Is, the, uh, is it like one. JavaScript? What else? Yeah, yeah, Ruby. yeah. Multilingual is like it's like nine languages yeah. across like forty repos. But yeah, you got them like. JavaScript, Rust, Java, C, you know, Ruby. Yeah, yeah, you got him. Yeah. And then Core Studio Bench itself, a lot of people like they they talk about the, the Django focus. Yes. <laughs> Django. Uh, is there <laughs> is, is there is there like I don't know, how do we how do we move past Django? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it's cool to see um a lot of the newer benchmarks like really try to diversify the repos. Like in the two follow-ups we did with multimodal and multilingual, we made it a point to do that. So I think- But you can also just put out Sweetbench 2025 and just- That is true. And do a new distribution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's been cool to see the follow-ups. I think quietly, and, and it's an open question for me, I'm excited to see how people curate the next sets. Like it's kind of interesting to see in the literature or in their blog posts, like how they're justifying why they're creating their separate split. The easier ones were like, oh, more languages, more repos. And then I think now people are like, well, ours is more difficult because of this curation technique. And I'm, yeah, I'm excited to see how, how long that lasts and, you know, where we're going to like guide the evaluations towards. Yeah. And more recently, you're working on Code Crash. Yes, that's right. Uh, so let's yeah. give people, you've already done other episodes, uh, other podcasts about it. Yeah. I'll refer people sure. to, to that with uh, your chat with Andy. Yeah. Uh, but just give like a people like a one, two sentence. Yeah, no, happy to do it, especially on your podcast. It's an honor. Um, yeah. So basically, the idea is I don't like unit tests as a form of verification. And I also think there's an issue with Sweet Bench where all of the task instances are independent of each other. So the moment you have the model kind of submit it, oh, it's done, you know, and, and, and that's the end of the story, the end of the episode, you know. So with Code Clash, what we're thinking is, let's try to really evaluate like long horizon development and uh, development on a code base that is consequential and conditioned upon what a model did, you know, before to that code base. And so the general idea is you have two or more language models and they play a programming tournament. And what that means is each model maintains their own code base and each round of the tournament, first they get to like edit and improve their code base however they see fit, very self-determined. And then in the competition phase, those two code bases are, are pitted against each other. So the code bases are run and there's generally an arena, you know, we have a lot of diverse arenas, but the arenas determine like code base A is better than code base B. And then you kind of repeat that across multiple. As determined by an LM judge. Yeah, yeah. So LM judge is definitely one of the mechanisms. Uh, we started with some pretty like simple programming games. So one of the cooler ones is like Halite, which uh, might- Oh yeah, cool. I played it uh, for Jane Street. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. You know, that's awesome. Yeah, Halite 1, 2, 3, like Michael Troll of Cursor wrote this uh, game. Two, two similar Jane Street. Yes. 
Yes. Oh, oh, two sigma. Two sigma. Two, two sigma. I worked at two sigma. I'm like, uh, oh, there you go. Yeah. And this is too long ago. There you go. Yeah. 2016 at this point, but we're bringing it back, you know. Highlight is fun. I, I, I would say if you've never done a programmatic competition where you have to control fleets of uh, ships and attack things and defend things yeah. uh, and collect resources, yeah. It's like you play StarCraft, but you can code. Right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. A lot of games. Yeah. Is there, are there non games? Or are you focused no, on games? I think that's an excellent point. So for kind of the initial release, for scientific purposes, we kind of use existing programming games. Uh, the current ongoing effort is, you know, to build economically valuable arenas. That's, you know, the popular word these days. So yeah, yeah. Sweet Lancer is a big one this year. Yeah, GDP GDP is awesome. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, I think the big selling point of Terminal Bench and Sweet Bench and these evals is that you know, it's really close to real world utility. And so I think it's resolvable for Code Clash, and that's what we're working on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you're part of uh, Ophir's group. Yes. <laughs> um, the other students have also been putting out a lot of other stuff. Uh, what would you highlight? Yeah, no, I mean, Ophir is such a prolific mentor when it comes to benchmarking. Sweet efficiency, I really like in the line of yeah. performance. Yeah. What's the TLDR on that one? Yeah, for sure. Um, so Sweet efficiency was wrote by this PhD student called Jeffrey Ma, who happened to be my high school classmate. And the idea there was like, you take a code base and you just want to, you know, do modifications that will literally make the code run faster. So I think it's like parallelization, SIMD operations, stuff like that. Yeah. So so no no behavior change, just faster. Exactly. Okay. Keep the unit test passing, but I want better runtime. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then there, there's algo tune that is kind of in line with that. And then there's also kind of pushing along like the scientific coding domain. Uh, Psycode. Psycode. Yeah, exactly. Which is last year. Psycode yeah. 2 is awesome. They did like a quick. quick and, and for, for yeah. people, Psycode is, my, my, the way I explain Psycode is it's human eval, but better. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think, you know, there's a lot of good stuff that these days where, yeah, that's that's the way to go. It, which is like. <laughs> Sweet bench is expensive to run. Any agentic benchmark is expensive to run. Yeah. Actually, you do need some completions benchmarks. Yeah. That just, just, just complete. Exactly. Like you know, you can do well on those first, and then sort of graduate to the multi-turn expensive stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other than that, just like broadly, other work in the field in 2025 uh, yeah. in terms of coding evals. Um, obviously, we shot up meter. They use Sweet bench, and they have a very interesting, like I guess, human hours worked. Number? Yeah, they like the x-axis being sort of the runtime, and their or yeah, y-axis being the completion. You know, like we can do more long-running stage and tasks. Yeah, I think the projections are are quite interesting, and I definitely appreciate them kind of using Sweetbench Verified to to sort of proxy a lot of these things. But yeah, they're great. You know? Okay. Yeah. Any other work that like call your eye? That's kind of yeah. I mean, I, I think within the co okay terminal bench Sweetbench. Uh, yeah, critical point was kind of cool. Um, critical the, point? Yeah, it's like a very new benchmark that uh, Ophir did, um, and I think it's kind of related to physics. Um, there's this one called SecBench, kind of related to cybersecurity. Security. Yeah, exactly. SRE Bench, which I, I think is affiliated with LOD. Like, it's just cool to kind of see people really dive into different coding domains. And then stepping a little bit outside of coding, um, I personally think it's quite interesting to think about the user simulator stuff. So like, Tau bench, vending bench, Tau bench too. Yeah, and, and vending bench, and I, I got mixed maybe. feelings. Uh, yeah, no, I'm interested. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's like it's like you're sampling one path. I, I don't know how realistic it is, to be honest. It's, yeah, it's just, it's just yeah. the hell of this, but it is cool. No, for sure. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's a good initial effort. Um, to me, I think it's super cool to see companies like you know, I'm sure Mercor and stuff are focusing on building environments like for code, beyond code. And so I think it, it might be interesting to have like work gym style stuff. This is stuff that my advisor, D. Young at Stanford thinks about a lot. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just realized we had, we're talking about terminal bending. Yes. <laughs> we're probably on the hardware no, folks. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, really, really, really good work uh, just overall. Um, yeah. yeah, let's talk about Tau Bench because yeah. uh, you mentioned sure. Tau Bench. Yes, yes. Uh, there's some discussion, or some people are saying that Tau Bench is uh, impossible to get a high score on mm. because some of the tasks are underspecified or just impossible. Yeah, I don't know if you're up to speed on that. I'm a little bit it's a little spicy. Speed. Yeah, it's a bit spicy. I think I saw so I you know for like I worked with Shunyu and Karthik back in Princeton very closely. I think Karthik I just saw posted a tweet kind of um, defending. Uh, yeah, like rebutting <laughs> some of these claims. Um, yeah, I mean it, it's I, I think I get the concern, um, but 
Yeah, I think it also brings up just maybe like interesting research problems to solve of like, okay, like why is it impossible? Is it the ambiguity? Is it kind of the user simulator that has issues? And I think generally we all agree that, you know, we'll improve on these things over time for events. So I actually really like benchmarks that intentionally, uh, I think we should intentionally include impossible tasks mm -hmm. as a flag. Yeah, of like, hey, you're cheating. Yes. It's kind of sad that like, Kartik actually is defending it because the master move would be like, oh yeah, you caught us. Like that, that, that was, uh, you know, like everyone reporting above 75 on Tao Bench Retail, uh, you've been cheating. Yeah. <laughs> oh, interesting. It's, that would be, that would be cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you'll have to ask the Tao Bench authors, but yeah, no, that, that's, that's fun. Um, yeah, I, I think there was a impossible bench was a recent benchmark, uh, maybe from was it from Anthropic? I don't know, but they basically took Sweetbench Verified and they changed the issues to make them impossible. And they checked like how often the models would be like, I actually just can't do this. I don't know what's going on. Oh, like uh, for refusals. Yes, yes, yes. So, oh, how did they do? I thought that was interesting. I think they're all the models are all kind of attempting and saying like, oh, I did it. You know, so maybe not great. On that's cool. Front. But yeah. no, that, yeah. that's a that's an important one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how does Cody evals evolve next year? Wow, that's a great question. I mean, honestly, I think. I think it's people will make more sweet benches. Um, I think terminal bench has really got something going where you you, you ask people to, you know, a sweet bench you're you're confined in some sense to the domain of issues and PRs that already exist, um, which I think has its benefits of being close to reality and natural. But I think with Terminal Bench, there's a lot of creativity that you can infuse into that. So I would personally be really excited. Like the 2.0 job was really excellent. And I'd be super excited to see, you know, 3.0, 4.0. Be because of like the environments? Yeah, I mean, the angle. environments, you know, bringing more people into the fold, you know, I think, uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, but early on you had PhD students, very smart CS people who are adding tasks. And, you know, what does that look like when you fold more coding environments for non-coding tasks, non-coding environments in general, and ask people to make stuff there? So that's pretty cool. And then, of course, for myself, I think just like this long-running sweet agent kind of thing just feels very compelling. I think the vision of like, hey, I tell it a goal. I don't have to be super specific about my task. I have like a decent verifier that proxies what I want. Something literally like a code base that makes the most money in this like setting, you know, like that's my verifier, you know, and I walk away for five hours. The thing is just running. I'm hanging out with you, talking to my friends. I come back and it gives me like literally a soda code base on, on, on that, you know, task. I think that would be super cool. Okay, I'll push back. We're part-time in Cognition. Yes. And we are uh, emphasizing a lot of interactivity. Because the, the point is that you're going to underspecify, right? Right. And actually what people want is back and forth, back and forth and on like a really mm. fast time frame, which is terrible for a benchmark author, <laughs> right? Because yes, how you do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but but realistic. Yeah. So um, I, I think like the, this, uh, this, this is where I, I'm a little bit anxious or cautious about this push for long autonomy. Right. We're gonna, I mean, you know, let's say this time next year, we'll have... Five hours is is pessimistic. Like yeah, it, it'll be it'll be twenty four. It right? Yeah, right. Days. Yeah. Um, yeah. but I don't know if that actually materially changes the industry. Mm. So we will push it like as an evals. You know, we have the people people make evals here. Yeah, we push the industry in ways that we wanted to push, but I don't know if we like that's a productive way because that's more of like a a stunt that that like yeah, it's a proof of concept that proof existence proof it can be done. Yeah, but will you use it? At, in, in practice. For real life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, um, to me, I think there's there's potentially room for growth. So I, I would actually agree with your, your take here. Um, I mean, uh, with my lab at Stanford, with Dee, like there's a, you know, her emphasis is on human AI collaboration. And so I, I definitely don't believe in this idea of just kind of getting rid of the human. Um, but yeah, maybe just like finding the balance of like, you know, just because the developer ecosystem is so diverse and there's so many participants in it who want different things out of it, like just enabling different levels of abstraction. Um, and, you know, it depends on the task. Like there's settings where you want to be, you know, more involved and more sort of hands-on. And so you want to use Windsurf for that. But then maybe there's kind of this general data processing thing. It's just a lot of JSON parsing you don't really care about. And that's the one I kind of want to walk away from and just let it figure it out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree with you generally. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Any calls to action? What, what do you want help on? How can people, uh, I guess, like find more of your work? Definitely. For the call to action, super jealous of all the great data that cognition and you know cursor would get like that user interaction data is like 
really fascinating. From an academic standpoint, it feels like there's two difficult approaches to resolving that. Either you build like a really compelling product like El Marina that people have people use consistently, which is, I mean, really tricky in and of itself, or you build like really good user simulators that try to mimic sort of these settings. Uh, but that is also like non-trivial. I don't think it's as simple as, hey, ChatGPT, act like a human, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it would be really cool to sort of get inspiration of like, what exactly does that data look like? Or, or between the two, like what's the best way to scale up sort of evaluating human AI interaction? And then I think for visibility for my own work, pushing more arenas. Like I think for, for Code Clash, what I'm excited about is the current framing is really long running sweet agents, but you know, you could have multi agents, like two agents work together on the code base. Mm. And what happens? You have a human and an agent work on the code base versus just AIs. What happens there? You know, like when the models improve and hopefully they hill climb and they become better at digesting logs and iterating on analysis, you know, how does how does human AI interaction like change with model capability? Um, and so I'm kind of hoping, you know, I'm trying to inspire and, and, and convince people that it's a very cool test bed where you can do a lot of different sort of combinations of like human AI on different arenas, playing one arena at a time, n arenas at a time, you know, and just, you know. Yeah, I think very interested to work with you on, on the interaction stuff. Oh, that would be awesome. Um, and then yeah. I, I think the, uh, one, one more thing I'll add is for Cognition uh, is going to be pushing a lot of code base understanding, which is kind of yeah. code base retrieval plus plus. Yes. And yes. mostly it is helping um, humans understand their own code bases better to enable humans yeah. or to, to sort of mind meld the human with the machine uh, to do the highest possible task that LLMs could not do alone, humans couldn't, couldn't do alone. And then the other thing is also auto, like basically automatic context engineering for an LLM. So that, that, that is like sort of like a research sub-agent uh, that, we're, that we're working on. That's so uh, awesome. Yeah. So I don't know what the benchmark would be because like, how do you, how do you benchmark understanding? That is true. <laughs> uh, apart from, I think like, just, yeah, it's also mostly like you freeze a repo, um, have some manually curated answers and then, you know, pose trivia questions. That's very easy to saturate. So I don't know how else. Yeah. Do I think um, I think Silas tweeted a while ago, like sort of like the the wiki, the code wiki stuff. Yes. That, uh, that's incredible. I mean, I, I use yeah, it with, on the with uh, Google actually just uh, came out with their own version. Oh, yeah, yeah, with the, the anti gravity people. That's uh, no, no, no. This is like a separate. It's a separate different team. Yeah, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Um, yeah, but cool. That's the state of code. Yep.